Hello, and thank you for joining the 92nd Newberry Film Festival webinar. I'm James Kennedy. I'm a children's book author and the founder of the 92nd Newberry Film Festival. Today I want to tell you about our film festival and why you might want to encourage your students in making their own 92nd Newberry movies. Ever since 1922, the Newberry Medal has been recognized as the most prestigious award in children's literature. But it turns out that any book, no matter how worthy and somber, becomes hilarious when it's compressed to only 90 seconds. That's where the 92nd Newberry Film Festival comes in. It's an annual video contest in which kid filmmakers create weird short movies that tell the entire story of a Newberry Medal or Honor winning book in about 90 seconds. Not a video book report and not a book trailer. The idea is to get the whole plot out in under two minutes, often with some weird twist in which the kids make the story their own. Filmmakers can adapt any medal-winning or honor-winning book. Our film festival is now five years old. Every year we share the best 90-second Newberry movies at special event screenings in New York, Chicago, cities all over the country, including, as of last year, San Antonio. These screenings are kid-friendly events co-hosted by me and another children's author from that city. Past hosts and guest stars include bestsellers like John Cheska, the author of Stinky Cheese Man and Other Fairly Stupid Tales, Rebecca Stead, author of When You Reach Me, Blue Balliot, author of Chasing Vermeer, Kate DiCamillo, author of Tale of Despero and Because of Winn-Dixie, and many other authors. Here I am with Texas author Nikki Lofton, author of Wish Girl and Nightingale's Nest, back in January at the 2016 San Antonio screening. To give you an idea of what the 92nd Newberry is like, let's look at one of the first movies that was made for it, of Madeline Lengel's 1963 medal winner, A Wrinkle in Time. Now, if you haven't read the book in a while, A Wrinkle in Time is about an awkward girl, Meg, who has a four-year-old brother, Charles Wallace, who is a genius but a little creepy, their father is being held prisoner on an alien planet. Uh, three witches show up at Meg's house and they use a string and an insect to teach Meg and Charles Wallace how to travel through hyperspace, which I call tessering. They go to the alien planet, which is controlled by a giant disembodied brain, where brainwashed children are mechanically bouncing basketballs. And Meg somehow defeats that disembodied brain using the power of love. Uh, I never quite understood the ending. Anyway, here we go. A Wrinkle in Time in 90 Seconds. Meg, it's raining. I hate my life and I can't sleep. Here's hot milk and a sandwich. How did you know, Charles Wallace? I'm a five-year-old genius. But spooky. Mom, where's Dad? He's on another planet. I hear something outside. He is on another planet. Gravity is the soul of which? Shakespeare. It's time to disappear! But what is Tessera? You see this string. Okay, I get it. Who's this guy? I'm Calvin O'Keefe. I'm popular, but sensitive. And only I understand just how special you are, Meg. What was that? As you can see, it doesn't necessarily require fancy resources to make an entertaining 90-second Newberry. Just a clever script, some kids who enjoy hamming it up, and a willingness to learn iMovie or Windows Movie Maker or whatever. The sets here are literally the front yard, the backyard, and the basement. The costumes are just stuff that they found in their houses and what they're already wearing. You notice that all those other kids have stopped dancing, but that one kid keeps on dancing? 
I have a feeling he doesn't know that everybody else has stopped. Okay, I go around and all right, and fall down. There we go. And as you can see, if you want to learn more, you can just go to 90secondnewberry.com. So the screenings and the movie look fun, but why would it be worthwhile for your students to do it? Actually, there is a lot your students can learn from participating in the 92nd Newberry Film Festival. We have six main educational goals with the 92nd Newberry. Number one is to entice students into reading and discussing Newberry winning books, including older, maybe forgotten titles. I love receiving movies for books that I thought nobody read anymore, like William Bowen's 1922 honor book, The Old Tobacco Shop, which truly is a bizarre hallucinatory book that has to be read to be believed, or Wanda Gogg's 1929 honor book, Millions of Cats, who that has a plot that's really quite grisly and surreal. When I asked those filmmakers why they chose those books, they said it was because they wanted to make a movie of a Newbery winning book that nobody had done before for the festival. So this festival can get kids reading out of their comfort zones. The second goal um, for the 90 Second Newbery is to encourage the close reading necessary to write a script that wittily sums up a book in just 90 seconds. Check out the script for that Wrinkle in Time movie that we just watched. There are under 30 lines in the whole thing, and yet it gets the gist of the book across with not only the dialogue, but also with visual storytelling. More on that later. Educational goal number three is to encourage participants to learn the basics of visual storytelling and competent filmmaking. Making a movie is a real skill. It's not just pointing a camera at a bunch of kids and, and doing a play in front of it. Um, that, For instance, that Wrinkle in Time movie had 25 different cuts in it uh, and various camera angles. If you want to succeed, you've got to plan your shots, figure out how to cut the whole thing together, do post-production music and sound effects in that Wrinkle in Time movie. It's a large-scale project that takes skill to manage through to the end. But the great thing is, with modern tools, it's doable. Educational goal number four is to give opportunity for students to use new technologies, such as video equipment and editing software, in a constructive way that promotes literacy. I mean, every Mac has iMovie on its standard these days, and every Windows machine has Movie Maker on its standard. Sometimes the school has video cameras lying around, and many kids have video cameras right on their phones. This is an unprecedented wealth of technology that we can take advantage of um, and to make something that's rooted in worthwhile books and literacy. Educational goal number five is to provide a public forum for the students' final products to be celebrated, both online and in live screenings. The top movies I receive are shown around the country at our special event screenings, and each movie I receive is featured on the 92nd Newberry website with judges' comments. Participation in the film festival has even led to interactions with the authors of the books. When kids made 90 Second Newberries of Grace Lynn's Where the Mountain Meets the Moon and Neil Gaiman's The Graveyard Book, both authors featured the 90 Second Newberry movies on their blogs. And when students at a Chicago school made a movie of the 2011 honor book Heart of a Samurai, the author, Margie Preuss, actually visited the school of the kids who made the movie because she wanted to meet them in person. So you can make actual personal connections with the authors of this festival. And finally, educational goal number six is to inspire students to take ownership of these stories by recreating it in their own style, creatively transforming the story through genre twists, irreverent commentary, unconventional point of view, etc. At the 92nd Newbury, we're not really interested in straightforward retellings of the story. We're more interested in how can the students make the story their own, make it fresh and new and weird? What unexpected angle can they put on the material? For instance, that Wrinkle in Time video that we saw was good, but it was straightforward. To make a standout 90 second Newberry, it should be more than just a smart aleck summary. This next movie is an adaptation of Charlotte's Web, but check out the fun spin the filmmakers put on it, retelling it in a musical style and shot like the opening credits of a 1970s superhero TV show and sung to the tune of the theme to Spider-Man, which makes sense because Charlotte's a spider. Alright, let's watch it. Charlotte's Web, Charlotte's Web, making miracles with her friend. Spins a web that brings surprise, with her words she saves lives. Look out, here comes Charlotte's Web. See that pig in the mud, she will faint at the thought of blood. Your arm will both soon be dead, just take a look overhead. See there, there's hope.
the trolley fair. From the farm to the fair, eating animals everywhere. You can eat him any day, danger's never far away. That's why he needs Charlotte's love. In the chill of the night, with her own special twine, she in secret fights to save the life of Swan. Charlotte's red, Charlotte's red, frightening generous lots of legs. Think it's fame while she's ignored, making friends is her reward. So please, whenever you are shaken, she'll come to save your bacon. Look out for Charlotte's web! The lesson? Make it weird. Don't just do a straightforward adaptation of the book. Give it a strong twist that will transform the story into an entertaining piece in its own right. Challenge your students to make something that even a stranger would enjoy, not just their teachers, friends, and family. To that end, challenge them to give it a wow beginning like they do here, how Charlotte and Wilbur kick open the door as the camera zooms in with a flourish of music. Challenge your filmmakers to grab the audience's attention immediately. This movie is interesting to watch because there's so much movement. Jumping, fighting, and running is more fun to watch than people standing around talking. And look at how they got such cool superhero effects on zero budget. To make them look like they're doing super jumps, they use trampolines. Or they reversed, sped up, or slowed down footage to make their feet look superhuman. So, we saw how Charlotte's Web was transformed there by adapting it into the musical superhero genre. But just to prove how changing the genre can completely transform the entire story and give the kids the opportunity to make something truly unique and creative and not a mere retelling of the story, let's look at Charlotte's Web again, but this is a different version. In this one, instead of a cheery superhero musical, Charlotte's Web is done in the style of a horror movie. Which makes sense. After all, the first line of the book is, where's Papa going with that axe? And the whole story revolves upon whether or not the pig main character, Wilbur, will be eaten by his human family. Charlotte's a pretty creepy spider, and after she dies, her millions of eggs hatch and the countryside is covered with spiders? That's horrifying. Let's watch the beginning of Charlotte's Web horror style. Take the pig. So what are some other genre switches you can do? For instance, Beverly Cleary's 1978 honor book, Ramona and Her Father, is done here as a musical. Because we're happy. Clap along in your panic. Because you've just lost your job. Because we're happy. Clap along if you're upset. Because your dad just lost too much. Because we're happy. Clap along if you feel mad. Because your sister is a pest. Because we're happy. Clap along if you feel hopeless. Even though you tried your best. And here, Ramona and her father is done in the style of James Bond. Good evening to Martini. Shake it. Not stirred. We know. Halloween! Family pumpkin carving night! Wow, Dad, that looks really cool! I've also seen Sid Fleischman's 1987 medal winner, The Whipping Boy, done in the style of Star Wars. <laughs> Richard and Florence Atwater's 1939 honor book, Mr. Popper's Penguins, done in the style of a zombie apocalypse. Them on, on stage? Doesn't you know that applause makes this type, this breed of penguin go crazy? Here, Margie Price's 2011 honor book, Heart of a Samurai, was done as a samurai movie, all in Japanese. Samurai! 
In Karen Cushman's 1996 medal winner, The Midwife's Apprentice, is here done as a cowboy western. Or how about Rebecca Stead's 2010 medal winner, When You Reach Me, done in the style of an episode of Law and Order. Why did you taste out? I didn't want anything bad to happen. Yes, you did. You knew that truck was coming. Calm down, detective. Okay. So why do we encourage kids to shake up their movie with a change of medium or genre? Because by changing the story that's being told, the young filmmakers are free to take ownership of it to change it more freely, to make artistic choices that are outside the text. Now, students can give their movie adaptations a twist not only by recasting the story in a different genre, but also by making the movie in an unusual medium. For instance, stop-motion claymation. Here's a version of the very first Newbery Medal winner from 1922, Hendrik Willem van Loon's The Story of Mankind, done entirely in stop-motion claymation. Making a movie in claymation is a painstaking process, but as you can see, the results can be very satisfying. But that's not the only interesting medium I've seen used for the 92nd Newberry. Here are some other ideas. Arnold Lobel's 1973 honor book, Frog and Toad Together, done as a puppet show. We look brave. Yeah, but are we? Or Lloyd Alexander's 1969 medal winner, The High King, in Lego Stop Motion. And Wanda Gogg's 1929 honor book, Millions of Cats, done in Minecraft. Tom went on a journey and walked forever and a day. Finally, he came to a land full of cats. Hundreds, thousands, millions of cats. And Avi's 2003 medal winner, Crispin, The Cross of Lead, done as a black and white silent movie. Beverly Cleary's 1982 honor book, Ramona Quimby, age 8, done with all robots. So good. Or Patricia Riley Giff's 2003 honor book, Pictures of Hollis Woods, done in a mixed media animation style. And now in the fall, a new place, a new start. Josie was Movies Are Beautiful. And Gail Carson Levine's 1998 honor book, Ella Enchanted, done entirely with string. Then he decided to send her to finishing school. Or Lois Lowry's 1994 medal winner, The Giver, done as a one-man show. Whatever that means. Oh, I'm going to be released in a few weeks. I hear he was released elsewhere. Hey, don't do that or you'll be released. There's a million ways you could go. Maybe you could tell the story entirely in emojis. Here's Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, told totally with emojis. Or, 
How about telling the story in the idiom of a side-scrolling video game, like Super Mario Brothers? You could create that story in the form of a side-scroller digitally, or you could make a side-scrolling story in an analog style, like these folks did. So that way you wouldn't even have to know how to program, but you could still use that style of storytelling. Or how about setting up an elaborate Rube Goldberg machine to tell the whole story in one continuous take? Imagine something like this video by the band OK Go, but rigged so that different plot points and characters could appear as a chain reaction causes things to happen all in one shot. You could combine forces with the physics teacher at your school and make a project that's truly interdisciplinary. The deadline for submitting movies to this year's 92nd Newberry Film Festivals is December 19th, 2016, but you can turn in your movie anytime. The San Antonio screening is January 21st, 2017. You can find complete information at 92ndnewberry.com. Let's say you're intrigued. This sounds like a good idea to you. You want to make a 90-second Newberry with your students and submit it to the festival. You want to make something that's good enough to be accepted for the festival, but you and your students have never made a movie before. Maybe it's daunting. Where should you start? Here's a couple of points. First, see if you can connect the project to existing curricula. There's a Newberry winning book for almost every subject. Even nonfiction Newberries, like Stephen Scheinkin's Newberry Honor winning book, Bomb, about the making of the atomic bomb, or Jim Murphy's honor book about the Chicago fire, The Great Fire. As I mentioned with the Rube Goldberg machine idea, see if you can collaborate with different departments in the school. You could have the art department make the sets and props or puppets, have the school band make original music for the movie, or have the drama kids act in it. How can your movie make your whole school shine? Many different talents are needed to create a movie. It's rare for someone to make a watchable movie all by themselves. It takes a team, and in your teams of kids, everyone might be, do a little bit of everything, though usually one team member might prefer to shine primar primarily as a scriptwriter, others primarily as actors, another as a director, another as an editor, etc. Finally, the teacher or facilitator needs to use her judgment about how active a role she or he wants to take in the project, especially considering the ages of the participants. Making an entertaining movie that strangers would want to watch, even a 90-second one, can quickly become a daunting project. For instance, younger groups might lack the patience to edit the movie, which can be a tedious and technical process. Other teams might lack the planning skills to organize and implement such a large-scale effort, although this is great practice in doing just that. Adult facilitators must judge how much they should help. Not so much that they take over the project outright, but not so little that the entire project collapses because of the student's not yet fully developed focus. Now, even before you choose what book you're going to adapt, sometimes it pays off to consider what resources you already have. What do you already have in terms of costumes and props that you can use? If, for example, you and your students already have a bunch of toy lightsabers and a Darth Vader mask lying around, Maybe it's worth considering doing the book in the style of Star Wars to, in order to take advantage of those resources. Also consider the personalities and performance styles of the different participants in the group. Is there some kid who would make the perfect pest like Ramona, or a fantastic spaz like Joey Pigza? Do you have some students who would want to show off their basketball skills in an adaptation of Kwame Alexander's 2015 medal winner, The Crossover? or a kid who does a hilarious impression of an old lady that you can use as a grandma dowdle in an adaptation of Richard Peck's 1999 honor book A Long Way From Chicago, or a bunch of fencers who want to show off their sword fighting skills in an adaptation of Lloyd Alexander's The Black Cauldron, or a bunch of roller skating enthusiasts who want to do roller derby in an adaptation of Victoria Jameson's 2016 honor book Roller Girl. Take advantage of your group's pre-existing skills. As you're considering what book to adapt, also take into account what locations you have access to that you could use for the movie. When San Antonio's Bibliotech group did their adaptation of a single shard, they took advantage of these fantastic outdoor locations. When the Texas Underdogs group decided to adapt the graveyard book, they made sure to use this real graveyard to make it seem more authentic. These locations are much more interesting to look at than the inside of a classroom or the back room of a library. Maybe you have a weird dark basement that you can use as the dark maze in Ursula Le Guin's 1972 honor book, The Tombs of Atuan, or a rope swing over a river that you can use for an adaptation of Bridge to Terabithia. Take advantage of what you've got. Also consider what can you borrow or buy cheaply for the movie. 
For instance, part of why this group did Heart of a Samurai was because they found second-hand kimonos for cheap at the Salvation Army, like two bucks per kimono. And the penguin costumes in this version of Mr. Popper's Penguins are just long-sleeved black sh shirts with white t-shirts that have been cut up so that they're just a neck and a bib. The rest of the costume is just construction paper, and they look like great penguins. As mentioned before, figure out who in your group is best to write the movie, who wants to act in it, who wants to do the camera work, who wants to edit it, and who wants to do the special effects. Set everyone up according to their talents, so you can set them up to win. So now that we've done our preliminaries, how do we make our movie? Well, first, choose a book and have your book group read it. Make sure it's a book that the group is enthusiastic about, that seems within reach of their skills, time, and resources. As an, and as I mentioned before, the most successful 90-second Newberries aren't just straight-up summaries of the book. Creatively messing with the books is encouraged, especially through genre switch or a weird medium. Have your group brainstorm what twists they're going to do for it, again, keeping in mind what's practical. Next step, figure out your resources and locations. We've already been over this. Third step, write your script. Here's a tip. Don't have a weak start. Kick the movie off with something promising, something fun, something compelling, scary, weird, an image or a line or a scene that grabs the viewer's attention. If writing a script beginning to end intimidates you, first remember that your script shouldn't be longer than two or three pages, so it's not a lot of writing. Next, give yourself permission to write a lot and then throw away most of it, keeping just the best and punchiest bits. Give yourself permission to write fragments out of order. If it helps, first think of some holy cow moments that you know will translate well to movies. And then, or some jokes, or some scene ideas based on your twist. And once you have a lot of them, then think of ways to string all those great ideas together. And that stringing together is your script. Also, don't be afraid to change the story. You have only 90 seconds, so it's unavoidable. You're going to have to cut a lot from the book. It's okay to merge two characters into one, to drop subplots, to change the order of events, etc. And if your changes are in service of the genre twist, Think about the horror version of Charlotte's Web, for instance, then all the better. Once you're done with the script, or while you're writing it, cast the roles. Not everyone wants to be an actor. Some kids are more comfortable behind the scenes. Make sure everyone who has a part acting really wants the part. Next, make the storyboards and shot lists. It's a good idea to draw little cartoons of what you think each scene will look like. You don't just want to show up on set with no idea of where to put the camera or how to frame the shots. Here are some storyboards for that Wrinkle in Time movie. Plan it out. Even if you get to the set and end up not using your plan, it's good practice for thinking and planning where the camera should be so that it's not just floating around anywhere. Next, get out there and shoot the movie. It's going to take more time than you think. Make sure you do multiple takes of, of the same scene from different angles, close-up, wide shot, two shot, and all the rest, with the actors reading the lines in various ways or even improvising. Don't just shoot each scene once and decide that you're done. You want to generate as much material as possible when you're shooting so that when you're editing it later, you have something to work with. If you're shooting over the course of several days, make sure your actors wear the same costumes and have the same props from day to day so that there are no continuity problems. Next, once the movie is shot, or even while it's being shot, it's time to edit the footage. You might find that shooting during the day and editing at night works. In the editing, you might discover that you need an extra shot, so you can do it right the next day. Getting into the ins and outs of editing is beyond the scope of this webinar, but there are plenty of resources online to help. This might also be time for you to add preliminary sound effects or special effects. Once shooting is finished and you've got a rough cut of the movie edited together, do some test screenings, not only so that the actors can see their hard work early on, but also for the prospective audience. Get feedback on your screening. Find out work, what worked and what didn't. And then, go ahead and re-edit, or perhaps reshoot some of the movie, and then rescreen it again until you get something that people love. Making art is an iterative process. You have to do it, and then revise, and then do it again, and then revise, and do it again, just like a piece of writing. Same thing with movies. Once you're re and then once you've got something that you think looks great, then you're ready to submit it to the 92nd Newberry Film Festival. Now, a couple notes about writing your script. It's easy for these movies to get confusing and incoherent because so much story information is being smushed into such a short time frame. But we always want to make sure our audience understands what is happening and why in the story so they don't get bored or confused. But how do you make these super shortened movies make sense? To get a grip on what you need to write in your script, 
Look at the novel again and try writing out the beats of the original story, that is, the important actions that cause big changes. For instance, in A Wrinkle in Time, Meg is dissatisfied her with her life, especially because her dad is missing. The next beat, Meg hangs out with Charles Wallace and they meet friendly witches. Then they discover their dad is being held on another planet. Then the friendly witches take them to the other planet, and so on. Here's a tip. After you write out your beats, and then you're trying to arrange them for your script to tell the story in the movie, try to link each beat with the next with a log as a logical cause and effect. You won't be able to do it with every beat, but as much as possible, write your beats such that each story beat can be logically connected to the next by saying, therefore, or by saying, but, but not, and then. Here's what I mean. Therefore demonstrates how the previous beat caused the next beat, but identifies the obstacles and conflicts getting in their way. But saying, linking each beat with the other with just and then just says one thing happened, then another thing happened, then another thing happened, and that doesn't feel like a story. Writing out the beats in this way might make the story easier to understand and manage, and don't be afraid to change the story a little in order to make it clearer. For instance, here's some examples of tying the beats together in a good way. I heard a noise outside, therefore I went out to investigate. That's cause and effect. She wanted to buy an apple, but the grocery store was closed. Their character tried to do something, but something got in their way. But here's some examples of when beats aren't tied together in a way that feels story-like. I went into the basement, and then my dog died. See, one isn't connected to the next, and so it's hard to see how it's a story. The audience will get bored and confused. He bought a coat, and then he won the lottery. See, it's just one thing after another. To be sure, there will be some beats connected like this, especially when you have so many story events that you're trying to cram into a little space. But as much as possible, try to limit these and-then connections for beats, and try to tell the story by connecting up the beats as much as possible with therefores and buts. Another tool that can help you grasp the broad outlines of a story and put it into some kind of order so that you can write a script is something called the story circle. This is something invented by Dan Harmon, who's a sitcom writer. Um, he feels that every story kind of follows the, the steps in this story circle, um, more or less. And the idea is, if you can arrange the events of your story so that they correspond to the circle, your movie will probably feel more story-like and make sense. The story circle goes like this. It starts at the top. First, the, the first step is you. Um, you. You establish a character, and that character is in kind of a zone of comfort. The next step is, going around the circle clockwise, need. You've established that character. Now you show that they want something, or something isn't right in this world. Third step is go. Uh, your character or characters enter an unfamiliar situation to get that thing that they need or want. Um, if this is Joseph Campbell, this would be the crossing the threshold part of the story. Um, the next step is search. They adapt to this new world that they've entered to get the thing that they want. They're in, if this is Joseph Campbell, this would be the road of trials. Um, next step, five, is find. They get what they want. Um, Again, going with the Hero of a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell thinks this would be, he would call this the meeting with the goddess. Um, they somehow get some version of what they're originally going for, but not maybe necessarily what they needed, and which leads to the next step, take. They pay a heavy price for it. You kind of meet your maker. There, there's some kind of dark night of the soul happens here. And then next step is return. Our characters return to their familiar situation, um, they're bringing it home, and then the last step is change. Our main characters have changed. Um, so this seems kind of like arbitrary. It seems like one particular story, but you'd be surprised at how elastic the story circle is and how many different stories that it encompasses and how much, if you're able to phrase the story of your 90-second Newberry in this way, it will feel like a story, even though it's 90 seconds, and you will be able to make something that doesn't seem like just a bunch of things that are arbitrary, collect, connected, and just a bunch of scenes that just flash by and the re viewer has no idea what happened, but it will really feel like a story. So, to, for example, let's look at a 90-second Newbery of Arnold Lobel's 1973 honor-winning book, Frog and Toad Together, in particular the vignette called um, Dragons and Giants. Um, and... Let's watch it, and then as we're watching this video, try to identify the story beats 
and how they correspond to the story circle. So let's see how Frog and Toad together fulfills the story circle. So at the beginning we have the you step. The character is in a zone of comfort, and indeed Frog and Toad are comfortable at home, sipping on drinks in front of their roaring fire. But then the, the story beat need or want. They want to find out if they're brave. So we go to the story beat of go, crossing the threshold. They leave the house to find out if they're brave. Step four, search. The Road of Trials adaptation. They encounter dangerous animals in this outside world, and they adapt by running away while insisting they are not afraid. Step 5. Find the meeting with the goddess. Frog and Toad come face to face with death itself, and nevertheless shout, I am not afraid! 6. Take. Meet their maker, paying a heavy price. They learn that the world is scarier than they bargained for, um, but they refuse to admit that they're scared. 7. Return. They run back to their comfy house. 8. Change. They have learned that they are in fact cowards, even if they won't admit it to each other. So you see, even though the story circle seems to be one particular story, actually in, you can find the commonalities between the story circle and many other stories and use that to write your script and make your the, the story of your novel, which when you're first looking at the novel, you're like, how am I going to make this into only 90 seconds? If you try to adapt it into the story circle, it might seem more story-like and you might be able to find a script more easily. It's just a tool. You don't, ne you don't want to necessarily force every story into this story circle. However, it's a tool that might be useful in some cases. So with all of this in mind, take your first whack at writing the script. Don't worry if your first draft is terrible or too long or unfunny or unoriginal. Just get a first draft done and then you can tweak it later. It often helps to have everyone in the group look at that early first draft and give their own opinions on it and so you could tweak it and get something that everybody likes. And of course, if your script is longer than two or three pages, you're probably running too long. Remember, these movies have to be short. 
And that should get you started on getting ready for your movie for the 92nd Newbury Film Festival. Remember, this year's deadline is December 19th, 2016, but you can turn in your movie anytime. The San Antonio screening is January 21st, 2017. Complete information about the film festival, including resources, further resources, it can be found at 92ndnewberry.com. And if you have any questions, email them to me, James Kennedy, at kennedyjames at gmail.com. I'll take all the questions of people from this webinar, and I'll make up a frequently asked questions list, and then I'll send them all out to you, and then that way you'll all have the answers to each other's questions. Thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to seeing what kind of movies Texas is going to make for this year's 92nd Newberry Film Festival. Bye!